Hello and welcome to the Pledgeless Society's webinar call. Today, December 16th, 2022, we host a talk to the authors on an introduction to constitutional law, 100 plus Supreme Court cases everyone should know. My name is Kayla Kleiss. I'm an assistant director of practice groups here at the Federal Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call, as the Federal Society takes no position on any particular legal or public policy issues. In the interest of time, we'll keep our introductions brief, but if you'd like to know more about either of our guests, you can access their impressive and full bios at fedsoc.org. Today, we're fortunate to have with us Professor Josh Blackman, who's a professor of law at the South Texas College of Law in Houston. He holds the Centennial Chair of Constitutional Law and is also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Professor Blackman has testified before Congress and advises federal and state lawmakers. He regularly appears on TV, including NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, and the BBC. Professor Blackman is also a frequent guest on NPR and other syndicated radio programs. He's published commentaries in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and leading national publications. Additionally, and perhaps most pertinent to this event, he's a co-author and editor with Professor Barnett of an introduction to constitutional law, 100 plus Supreme Court cases everyone should know. I'll leave it to him to introduce uh, Professor Barnett. One last note throughout the rest of the panel, if you have any questions, please submit them through the question and answer feature so that our speakers will have access to them when we get to that portion oh, of today's webinar. He brought a prop. With that, he brought a prop. Thank you for being with us today. My girls, are at, my girls are at school now. That's not fair. Well, I see two Barnetts on the screen. So who do we have? We have Professor Randy Barnett. Who, who's joining you, sir? This is Selma Jane Barnett, the Selma most, Jane Barnett. Most, re most recent granddaughter. Oh, well, that's just perfect. So I should know. I, by our book, the baby wants you to buy our book. Oh, this is totally really important. Totally shameless. Um, so let's talk about Dobbs, actually. So, no, just kidding. <laughs> that wasn't planned. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Randy and I are very happy to have you here. Uh, our purpose is to hawk our book, uh, but also to teach about some of the most important Supreme Court decisions of all time. So I shall do the obligatory plug. We have not one, but two versions of the book. The first version is the paperback. Now, you may have a version that has a first edition. This is the second edition. There's a plus next to it. And we added a number of new cases from this past term, including Dobbs, Bruin, the Coach Kennedy case, and a few others. So it's really up to date, brand new. The even cooler one is this one, which is an illustrated edition, coffee table book, hardcover. The book has photographs on every page, which illustrates all the books. It's a very good Christmas present. Now, I wish I could say it'll be arriving by Christmas, but due to the supply chain shortages, it'll be arriving shortly after Christmas. But you can order it now, and it will be a gift you will treasure forever. These are the penumbras from Griswold, if you will. Um, enough about that. Uh, we will be offering a free signed copy to those who have attended this call today. We'll have a drawing later. Uh, so if you're here and you, uh, 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 um, uh, Kayla, what do they have to do to sign up for the drawing? Message Kayla. Um, and you'll be entered to a drawing to win a free signed copy. So our goal today is to talk about four of the most important Supreme Court cases, show you some of the photographs from those cases, and play some of the video clips from our video library from those cases. So first off, let me just run through a few very cool spreads from our uh, uh, presentation. And one second, let me run, let this one run. Okay. So the first case that we want to talk about, oh, we'll have Q&A as well. So please put your uh, comments into the um, uh, uh, question board for later. Okay, so here's the cover, very good. The first case we're talking about is Gonzalez versus Raich. This was a case that Randy argued for the Supreme Court. A long form of medicinal marijuana was cool. Randy was trying to uh, use federalism and the Commerce Clause to get the Supreme Court to halt the enforcement of a federal gun control, I'm sorry, a federal uh, a controlled substance law. The second case we're talking about is more obscure, but also very relevant, Bradwell v. Illinois. Here we had a woman from Chicago, Myra Bradwell, who wanted to become an attorney. But at the time, the state of Illinois said, no, 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 women cannot be lawyers. She asserted that the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment gives her the right to become an attorney and pursue that livelihood. Okay. 
The third edition is the most recent one, is Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. And this case held that the 14th Amendment does not protect a right to terminate a pregnancy as Randy holds his beautiful granddaughter. <laughs> They're going to cancel us in five seconds. The last case we'll talk about is New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. This was a Second Amendment case. Here, I'm blocking Justice Barrett. Here, I'll go up here. Uh, it was a Second Amendment case from this past term, uh, and the court held the right to bear arms extends outside the home. But even more significant from an originalist perspective is that the court allowed for originalism to play a key role in deciding the scope of this amendment. Okay, enough about that. Uh, let me play a clip of Randy arguing the rage case, which is a very important decision that I'm sure his granddaughter will be hearing about for the rest of her life. <laughs> We didn't script any of this, by the way. All right, so let's, let's play a clip. This is Randy having an argument with a Justice Souter. Justice David Souter suggested that whether or not an activity was economic depends on whether it had an economic effect on the national economy. He then equated the economic effect on the interstate market of Angela and Diane's homegrown marijuana with that of Roscoe Filber's homegrown weed. If there would be a large market effect it makes no more sense to call this non-economic than Filburn's use. To this, I responded that Lopez and Morrison stood for the proposition that the mere fact that activities may have an economic effect on the market does not make them economic activities. To identify whether an activity is economic, you have to look to the activity itself. But an economic activity is one that's associated with sale, exchange, barter, the production of things for sale and exchange, barter, so, for example, prostitution <laughs> is an economic activity. Marital relations is not an economic activity. You could be talking about virtually the same act. As he's holding a baby. We don't say that because there is a market for prostitution, that therefore everything that has an effect on the market, because it substitutes for what can be obtained in the market, is itself economic activity. After this exchange, the justices drop the market substitute conception of economic activity. All right, enough of that. So, Randy, let's talk about rage for a bit. Uh, okay. How was your experience in rage, and what do you think students should learn from it today, almost you know, fifteen years later? Well, first of all, uh, Selma is very excited about the new book, and uh, that's why she de she demanded uh, Man. this, she demanded that she be on this program. This 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 is the her first video program of many that she will be on. But this is her first video, uh, first video parents anywhere. She, <laughs> but she now has asked to leave the program so that okay. I can talk. So okay. just so, so, but she, so goodbye. Hi, Selma. Hi, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as you can, as you might imagine, uh, the rage case um, is, is maybe not my favorite case to teach because I have to relive the outcome of that case. Um, every time I teach it. Uh, but one of the things that um, our book, our book uh, brings home um, is the nature of oral argument. One of the reasons why we pick this clip is because it shows that we illustrate the book with um, clips from oral arguments, clips from hand down statements, um, as well as uh, audio effects. Josh, what else do you want me to say about the rage case, about teaching the rage case? Maybe talk about how this case sort of came about. It's a really good origin story. Right. Well, I had been um, at the, on, the, on the faculty of Boston University, and I was well known for my scholarship on the Ninth Amendment. That was pretty much most of all I, I had done at that point. And uh, Rob Rach, um, who ultimately was married to Angel Rach, uh, asked me if I would uh, participate, I'd be willing to provide a brief on help, a private brief on the Ninth Amendment for the district court in a different case, the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative case. Um, and since that was a federal case, the Ninth Amendment actually did apply. Um, and I agreed to do that. It was actually, it was a Commerce Clause case first and foremost, but Justice Breyer's brother, uh, Charles Breyer, had asked us, had asked the parties to brief the Ninth Amendment. They went around the country to find someone who knew about the Ninth Amendment and they found me. So that attached me to the case. Uh, ultimately, Ju Judge Breyer lost interest in the Ninth Amendment, as all judges uh, inevitably do. 
Um, and we were left with this Commerce Clause challenge. But the problem with that challenge was that in the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative, money and marijuana were changing hands, which is not only economic activity, it is also the original meaning of commerce. Um, so it was interstate commerce, but it was commerce. And Rob asked me if I thought it would be a good idea if we could bring a case in which there was no economic activity whatsoever. And I said, sure. He asked me if I would lead up that team. Um, and I said, sure. And he said he had a couple of plaintiffs in mind, one of whom is the woman he had just married, Angel Rach, and the other is Diane Monson. And so he and I and a third lawyer um, uh, who had, was representing Diane Monson became the team that brought the Rach case, which ultimately ended up in the Supreme Court. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's now move to a second case that Randy will talk about, which is Bradwell versus Illinois. This is not a well-known case, but it involves a woman who sought a constitutional right to become an attorney in the 1860s. Was not abridged by the exclusion of women from the practice of law. For this reason, Justice Bradley wrote a now notorious concurring opinion joined by Justices Field and Swain, in which he attempted to differentiate women from men. Quote, the civil law, as well as nature herself, he wrote, has always recognized a wide difference in the respective spheres and destinies of man and woman. The natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex evidently unfits it for many of the occupations of civil life. He noted that under the laws of coverture, a wife has no separate legal identity from her husband. Therefore, quote, a married woman is incapable without her husband's consent of making contract which shall be binding on her or him. This very incapacity was one circumstance which the Supreme Court of Illinois deemed important in rendering a married woman incompetent fully to perform the duties and trusts that belong to the office of an attorney and counselor. So Randy, why is Bradwell of the Illinois such an important case that no one's ever heard of. Yeah, it's very interesting. That that case is part of our video on the slaughterhouse cases. Uh, everybody who goes to law school eventually hears about the slaughterhouse cases, and that is the case that was decided in, in uh, 1873, five years after the enactment of the 14th Amendment, that essentially gutted the 14th gutted the Pri Privileges or Immunities Clause, which was the heart of the 14th Amendment, thereby completely distorting the 14th Amendment from that day until this day. There's an overwhelming scholarly consensus that the slaughterhouse cases were wrongly decided, though the courts have uniformly refused, even the conservative originalist justices, other than Justice Thomas, have refused to reconsider the slaughterhouse case and revive the 14th Amendment, the Privilege Immunities Clause. What many people don't know um, is that the day after the slaughterhouse case was handed down, was handed down this other case, Bradwell versus Illinois, which also involved the invocation of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, this time of a woman who sought to practice um, law in the state of Illinois and who was barred from doing so on the basis of a Supreme Court rule that barred women from the practice of law. She also asserted a Privileges or Immunities Clause. And for the majority um, in, the, in Bradwell, it was an easy case because they were for the majority in slaughterhouse cases, the five justices who said there was no right to pursue a lawful occupation of the butchers in New Orleans. It was easy for them to say, and likewise, there is no right to pursue a lawful occupation for women practicing law. It just is outside the scope of the 14th Amendment, according to them. But what about the four dissenters um, in the slaughterhouse cases? Uh, Justice Field, Justice Bradley. Um, Justice Salmon Chase, who didn't write an opinion in either case. I'll get to that, that in a minute. Well, Justice Bradley, um, uh, who dissented in the Slaughterhouse case, the next day he concurred in the result of Bradwell, and he did so on the basis of this very famously misogynist opinion, which distinguished between the natural abilities and functions of women versus men and the legal status of women versus the legal status of men. Women could not, married women could not enter contracts on their own behalf. How could they be lawyers? And that opinion has achieved a great deal of prominence as sort of a, 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 wor a, a, a awful tale about how the 14th Amendment does not protect women. That's what a lot of uh, people, progressives say about the original meaning of the 14th Amendment. Um, and Justice Bradley's opinion, therefore, uh, the reason why Justice Bradley had to write that concurring opinion is that he believed there was a right to pursue a lawful occupation that was a privilege of citizenship, as did the other three dissenters 
in the slaughterhouse cases. And yet he had to explain why it was rational or reasonable that women be denied the a access to the practice of law, given their nature. What was so interesting about this is there was a dissenter in Bradwell, a mm -hmm. sole dissenter, and that is Chief Justice Salmon Chase, who's now become one of my great heroes. Um, and Salmon Chase, in, in a very poignant uh, line of the Supreme Court reporter, says the Chief Justice dissents from the decision mm -hmm. and all opinions in the case, meaning he dissents not only from Justice Miller's majority opinion, but he also dissents from Justice Bradley's concurring opinion. This means that Chief Justice Salmon Chase believed that there was a privilege or immunity uh, that included the right to pursue a lawful occupation, as he had said so in Slaughterhouse, and secondly, that it also uh, protects women um, from irrational discrimination, um, uh, and he believed that this was irrational discrimination. And that shows that the original meaning of the 14th Amendment was, su was susceptible to a reading that would protect women right at the moment that that case was decided. Uh, and so it's a very interesting case to be paired with Slaughterhouse, given that it was decided the day after. Why did Justice Salmon, Chief Justice Salmon Chase not write an opinion? He was mortally ill at the time. He'd suffered a series of strokes. Um, and in fact, he passed away three weeks after the decisions were announced. So there are two questions on Bradwell, I'll put them up now. Why did Bradwell bring as privileges or immunities and not equal protection? Well, equal protection there, as I explain in a different book with Evan Burnick, the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, it was about, it was not about discriminatory laws. It was about the failure of the government to protect people equally. Um, it was primarily about enforcement of the laws, but it was also about a, a fair adjudication of the laws. So it was really about a failure of the fundamental duty of government to protect its citizens. Um, and that was a very big problem because that was one of the biggest problems facing the freedmen in the South is that law enforcement was not extending to them the protection of the laws. Um, the Privilege and Immunities Clause is what was regulating the content of state statutes primarily, which says no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Now, this bars um, the absolute deprivation of any, everybody's privilege or immunities. So if the courts, if the state says there is no right to pursue a uh, lawful occupation of everybody, well, that's barred. But it also bars the discriminatory um, uh, provision of privilege or immunity. So it says, well, men can pursue a lawful occupation, but women cannot. That's also a violation of the Privilege or Immunities Clause, which was widely understood by those in Congress um, to be uh, unconstitutional um, um, uh, and or be, I should say protected by the 14th Amendment. But the Supreme Court ultimately, um, in an act of what I believe to be living constitutionalism, um, negates it because they thought that it gave too much power to the federal government and they liked the federalism that existed before the Civil War. Another question, I'll, I'll take this one, is why, if the husband and wife was a legal unity, this was under coverture, why couldn't Bradwell practice law under her husband's license if he was an attorney? Um, one of the issues that came up was actually about contracting and that one of the reasons why they need to have uh, the ability to contract was to have an attorney-client relationship. And under coverture, women had no rights to contract at all. So that I think part of the reason why uh, she could be an apprentice, so to speak, of her husband, but couldn't be the solo lawyer. And she was a very distinguished uh, member of the legal community. She was the editor of the uh, of an Illinois state uh, lawyer's uh, newspaper or magazine. Um, so she was not a slouch. Um, of course, one of the secret sort of the hidden facts of this case, which I don't even believe makes it into our book. It might have. I think it made it into our case book. And that is the fact that by the time Bradwell was heard by the court, Illinois had ad already admitted a woman to practice law. The case was probably moot. We don't know why the court didn't know that, why they weren't told that. Um, uh, but uh, we even know the name of the woman who was admitted to practice law. So this was a kind of a historical blip. Um, but it's still worth talking about because it's worth illustrating, A, the original meaning of the Privilege and Immunities Clause, and B, it is actually a distortion of the, 14, of the original meaning to say that it does not protect the rights of women. All right, let's go into case number three, which is Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health. This was the big abortion case last term. And I want to play some clips from the oral argument where Justice Sotomayor and Breyer get very concerned about the court's legitimacy. There was a sustained political movement to reverse Roe. During oral argument, Justice Breyer worried that with the super case like this, 
the rare case, the watershed case. That people will. Say, no, you're just political. You're just politicians. He warned that such politicization will. Kills us as an American institution. Justice Sotomayor stated the issue more bluntly. Sotomayor remarked that sponsors of the Mississippi law supported it. Because we have new justices on the Supreme Court. Sotomayor asked, will this institution survive the stench that this creates in the public perception that the Constitution and its reading are just political acts? She added, if people actually believe that it's all political, how will we survive? The Dobbs majority rejected this conception of legitimacy. Justice Alito contended that, quote, Casey broke new ground when it treated the national controversy provoked by Roe as a ground for refusing to reconsider that decision. The Casey plurality's understanding of legitimacy, Alito suggested, quote, went beyond this court's role in our constitutional system. All right. I, so, let me let me uh, remind uh, any of the viewers that just tuned in and may have tuned in late that the reason we're playing you these videos is that Josh and I spent two years and uh, over a hundred thousand dollars to make these videos to illustrate this book. And if you buy a copy of the book, as you'll see in this corner, you get a you get access you get access to the videos. Um, and so when you buy this book, you're not only buying a book, you're buying an audio video series that that are, that both you can use, your kids can use, um, um, who may be students in high school or college, um, uh, and or or your friends and and neighbors can use. I feel like this is the worst infomercial in Fedsock history. Um, <laughs> but to, to Randy's point, um, the reason why we produce these videos is to bring the court's arguments and opinion hand down to general people. Right. If you ever actually listen to the Supreme Court arguments, it might be an hour nowadays, more like two hours. And they're very disjointed. There might be a question here that connects to a question there. Maybe an hour later, they'll come back to it. We splice it. We take questions throughout the arguments, put into a single cohesive discourse that actually makes sense. In fact, you'll often hear my voice or Randy's voice sort of bridging a few words that are missing. So the question actually reads better. Uh, we also have the opinion announcement audio. That's when they actually announce the opinion in their own words. So it's great hearing Justice Scalia and Chief Justice Rehnquist read an opinion in their in their great voices. It's a, it's a cool part. Yeah, you uh, get the, you get to hear the opinions of the justices' own words. So even though Josh and I do narrate each of these videos, and we don't narrate the same ones, we we it's either one or the other of us who are narrating the videos. Um, to the extent possible, we like the, the historical actors to speak for themselves to the extent that we can technologically accomplish that there'd be less talking by us and more talking by other people. Right. So the Dobbs case, though, is significant because I think it changes the way we talk about constitutional law. Now, I've been teaching con law for about a decade, Randy, for for more years than that. But con law always had this sort of arc to it. Right. You sort of start you know, in the 1800s, you go through the 19th century, then you get sort of the Lochner era, then you have the New Deal, then you have the Warren Court, and then you have Roe, right? And it's like, whoa, what happened? And then you have efforts to try to reverse Roe, then you get Casey, and it sort of sticks around. And then it sort of follows trajectory because you have the Lawrence case, and you have a Burgerfell and Windsor, a few of the other decisions, but also sort of just follows the same trajectory, right? And we always taught, at least I did, that these cases are probably not going anywhere, right? That Roe happened, Casey was the shot, they had the votes and they lost the votes because Kennedy, O'Connor and Souter decides to write this joint opinion. But now that narrative falls apart. And once you sort of destabilize Casey, then you ask what other areas of constitutional law might be destabilized as well. And this is a huge open issue. So we sort of wrote this essay, this book, in a time of flux. By the way, our book was due to the press the first week in July of 2022. So I had about a week to write all these essays. Uh, it was a very compressed period. It was not pleasant. Uh, but we got it done in, in a short order. 
Um, but so much is just uncertain about where, where this case loss headed. And it's a very good teaching moment. Um, we hope students of all ages, in fact, even college students, like high school students, learn these cases and see that the arc of constitutional law is not fixed. It does, it does fluctuate over time. All right. Anything else on uh, Dobbs before I do Bruin? I'm not seeing anything. No, no. It was a question. Do you want me to, do you have anything to add on, on Dobbs or can you go to Bruin? Oh, for me. No. Uh, well, I guess, I guess, um, what do you, what do you, what do you think about the form of reasoning that Bruin, um, uh, we, we just did Dobbs, right? So what uh, the thing about Dobbs is that it's widely criticized as an originalist case as the fruit of originalism. And it may actually have reached an originalist result. Um, but one of the things that we try to make clear is that it was not originalist. It was not using originalist reasoning. Mm -hmm. um, it is a substantive due process case. And what the what the book tells is the arc of the theory of substantive due process and how the conservative justices developed a theory of substantive due process, uh, really beginning with Bowers versus Hardwick. Uh, but but since that case was reversed, it's Glucksburg versus uh, Washington, Washington v. Glucksburg. Um, and it's been that history and tradition, deeply rooted in the nation's tradition, history and tradition approach that they've been pushing for. Um, they lost the majorities to Justice Kennedy on several cases, which are famous, Lawrence and, and Casey. Uh, so they lost the majorities of, in those cases. And so the court was doing something other than that. Uh, and I know that when Josh and I were doing the first the first time we collaborated, I think Josh was urging me to take Luxburg out of the case book because it had lost. It was, was it, it, it was the loser theory. And my approach to this case book has always been you need to hear what both sides theories are, whether they're the majority and the minority. And so we kept Luxburg in. It turned out the majority, the minority approach. Mm -hmm. turned into the majority approach. Um, and as manifested in Dobbs, only Justice Thomas um, really discussed originalism in this case in a, in a concurring opinion that's raised a tremendous amount of hackles. Um, but the, 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 the main opinion is a conservative substantive due process opinion. There's a question in the, in the, in the chat. Is the Dobbs dissent clearly living constitutionalist? Yeah. Um, I think the Kagan, Sotomayor, Breyer say, yep, in the 1860s, they didn't understand that it was a right to abortion, but who cares, right? They wrote broad language and broad terms, and we should look to contemporary values. It was a full-throated embrace of living constitutionalism, and they got only three votes. So it's a huge reversal of what the court was in the 70s. I mean, there's another question, the Ninth Amendment. If you read Roe, Justice Blackman, no relation, doesn't even care the basis. Like, maybe it's the 14th Amendment, maybe it's the 19th Amendment. Who cares, right? We got, we, we got the vote, so the, the specifics don't matter. And you go ahead to 2022 and the text and history, I think, do play a much more significant role. Uh, in answer to the question by Luke um, about um, why doesn't the Ninth Amendment receive the just attention that it deserves is because both the progressives and the conservative justices are afraid of it the way they are both afraid of the, the privileges or immunities clause. Um, uh, and they're afraid of it for different reasons. And this came this comes out actually. Um, in the oral argument over the McDonald, the city of uh, uh, McDonald versus city of Chicago case, which we also cover in the book, uh, because Alan Gura is up there arguing that the right to keep and bear arms applies to the states via the privilege or immunities clause. And that was the question the court said was presented. Does the privilege or immunities clause apply here? Um, and uh, he got tremendous pushback from both the progressive justices and the, uh, all of them, but Justice Ginsburg in particular, who pressed him on whether the original meaning of the Privilege and Immunities Clause protected the rights of women. We've already covered that in the Bradwell case. Mm -hmm. uh, but he also got pushed back by Justice Alito, who asked on oral uh, during rebuttal of oral argument, does it protect the right of contract? Which I thought was a very illuminating question by, uh, because it, it suggests that he's thinking Lochner, that basically if you, if you recognize the Privilege and Immunities Clause or, and you recognize the Ninth Amendment, you are going to legitimate the protection of unenumerated rights, which the conservative justices believe is fundamentally illegitimate. And that it is the illegitimacy of protecting unenumerated rights that justifies a conservative approach to substantive due process that greatly limits its scope, probably to the rights that have already been uh, recognized and no, no further, no new rights. Um, and so um, they, they just the Chief Justice Roberts kind of made that clear. Um, in his questioning, again, stuff we talk about in our book, 
uh, and that is that you know if it, Substantive due process has limited the uh, the uh, range of unenumerated rights precisely because it's deemed by the court to be illegitimate. Recognizing the original meaning of the Privilege Immunities Clause would say, well, wait a second, maybe protecting unenumerated rights is not illegitimate, and the, the and they and the conservative justices uh, are are afraid of that. All right, let's do Bruin, and then we'll do the book drawing in a few moments. So this is the Bruin video. And by the way, these are all Randy's videos. It wasn't deliberate. We just picked four cases. I, I'm on the video as well. You'll see my long hair in the old clips versus the new clips. The court used analogical reasoning to determine if New York's proper cause standard was, quote, relevantly similar to historical regulations on carrying arms. During oral argument, Justice Thomas asked Paul Clement, the lawyer for the plaintiffs, about analogical reasoning. If we analyze this and use history, tradition, text of the Second Amendment, we're going to have to do it by analogy. Thomas asked Clement if he could give me a regulation in history that would form a basis for a legitimate regulation today. Thomas inquired. If we're going to do it by analogy, what would we analogize it to? In the majority opinion, Justice Thomas looked to potential analogies from four periods of time. First, the court looked to laws from medieval to early modern England. For example, the 1328 Statute of Northampton prohibited people from, quote, going armed. During oral argument, Paul Clement stated that the statute was a prohibition on either carrying unusual and dangerous weapons or using common weapons in a way that terrorized the public. However, there was another way to read the statute. Barbara Underwood, the New York Solicitor General, countered that carrying a gun would, by definition, terrorize the public. Guns were deemed to be offensive weapons. And thus, carrying arms was always prohibited. All right. And you see what we did there at the end, right? We sort of spliced together oral argument. Those actually all were together. They actually occurred almost 45 minutes apart. But when you put them one after the other, it actually makes into a very cohesive narrative, which is how we often conceive of the oral arguments is a discussion with lots of detours and, and, and off ramps, but there is a thread that connects them all. Um, there are a couple of questions about, oh, we have a winner. The winner of the drawing is Larry Fouché. Fouch? Are, we, are we French or not? I don't know. Fouché. Congratulations, Larry. Um, you can email me. My, my address is here. Uh, and we will connect you with that free book. I encourage also everyone else to order a copy. It will sit on your bookshelf and be a treasured icon. Um, but go... <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's going to sign off in, in mass. Uh, but the Bruin case is significant for a couple of reasons. Now, Matthew asks a question. Does the standard of review in Bruin possibly signal a change in other areas? That is, will the court move away from the standard of review? Um, you know, it's kind of weird. Justice Thomas seemed to suggest that the First Amendment is also an area where history and tradition matter. It's really not. The court, First Amendment jurisprudence is all over the place. It's modern, it's historical, it's whatever. I don't know if the court has enough of a stomach to sort of unwind half a century of precedence with regard to due process, with regard to uh, equal protection, with regard to the First Amendment and all these other areas. I don't know if they have that stomach. The Second Amendment is unique because it's an open field, right? There was no case law governing this other than Heller, which was decided not even a decade ago. But there's a risk, and I want to actually go to Joseph's question as well. If the courts apply the Bruin framework too stringently, the risk is a blowback. That is, if the courts start saying, aha, you can't require serial numbers on guns, right, uh, or, or violent felons have a right to carry firearms, it could backfire. And the Supreme Court might say, whoa, whoa, Clarence Thomas, I'm not with you on that one. I'm going to pull the brakes. We've got Roberts on board as well. Um, now, the upshot, though, is that the lower courts are going to resist Bruin, right? There might be some district court judges here and there who say, let's go strike down everything. That's not going to be the majority. What we've seen so far is on the Second Circuit, 
The Second Circuit has allowed every single one of New York's laws to go into effect. Restrictions on carrying in houses of worship, uh, even if the house of worship wants it. The requirement to submit social media references to go on to get a concealed carry license, right? A lot of these laws are just massive resistance to Bruin. And so far, the Second Circuit has approved of all of these measures. So Justice Thomas sort of made up this analogical reasoning. It sort of, it didn't come from a party. I have an original scholar looking at me in the face. He didn't make that up. I don't know who made it up. He made, Thomas made it up. So because it's sort of new, it's see how it shakes out. Uh, uh, with all with all con law, there has to be time to let it germinate. Uh, but I think in the interim, New York and California will keep fighting and resisting the decision. And unless the Supreme Court intervenes, the laws will not change much in those states. So I agree with that. Um, I, I don't think it's realistic to think the Supreme Court's going to stick with their own standard um, in this regard. Um, and the, the the evidence I would cite for that is the Bruin case itself, where they bless um, the constitutionality of a shall issue regulations. I have a shall issue carry permit myself in the District of Columbia, uh, which I got as a result of a court decision. It was a May issue jurisdiction until the Court of Appeals said it, that was unconstitutional. So I then applied um, for my concealed carry uh, license um, and it took, you know, it, that required me to submit to 18 hours of uh, classroom and range instruction um, at, at, at spread over two days at a cost of several hundred dollars. Um, it's a pretty onerous regime. Um, I think that it's not unreasonable to, requ to require that uh, people who carry in public understand the rules of the road the way the people that drive in public understand the rules of the road. You don't need 18 hours to do it, however, um, and that's kind of punitive. Um, and nevertheless, um, the Supreme Court blessed all of these laws, the sh these kinds of laws, notwithstanding the fact that there is no historical analog to requiring people who carry firearms to undergo this kind of training, none whatsoever. And they already said it was okay, or they seem to suggest it was okay. And that suggests that they are not going to seriously pursue this uh, or, or stick with this methodology um, if it decides cases in a counterintuitive way. I don't know what they will do, but they are very averse right now um, to the tiers of scrutiny approach, including strict scrutiny. Um, I agree with Josh. I think it's hard to believe that they would have the stomach to undo the doctrine that exists in other areas. But here they have been very loath to take on the tiers of scrutiny approach, what they dismissive, dismissively call balancing, which I don't think it's I don't think strict scrutiny is balancing, but they call it that because they don't like it. Um, and so I'm really not sure what they're going to do. But I know one thing, and Josh already hinted at that, if they don't stand up to the lower courts, the way that in, in the way that they did not stand up to the lower courts for a period of 12 years, probably because they did not have five votes to stand up to the lower courts um, it, uh, until the most recent composition of the court, then the then the lower courts are going to engage in massive resistance um, of this opinion, decision as they had engaged in resistance to the Heller decision and the McDonald decision. Uh, so they're going to the Supreme Court's going to have to take up some of these gun laws and maybe uh, these these decisions that are flouting Bruin. Uh, and and when they do so, maybe they'll become a little clearer about how they think the lower courts actually should go about this job. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's put some questions in the chat. Anyone else is uh, uh, please. This is your chance. Let me ask Randy. So this is the second edition of our book for the third edition. I'll ask you an unfair question. What case will drop out and what case thing will be added for the third edition? Uh, well, I'm trying to think of what cases I took out of um, my course this year, because there are cases in our case book that I took out of the course. I wish you had given me uh, time to think about that. No, because, that would not have been fair. Um, I don't, I, I, I'm not thinking of them. I mean, there's some campaign finance cases um, that I no longer teach because I don't think they're as relevant. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Josh? Maybe if you give me one, maybe I'll think sure. of one. Well, I'll tell you preemptively, we took out Gruder and Gratz, right? We removed those cases preemptively. The Harvard UNC case will supplant those. That's easy. We also removed uh, 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 Van Orden v. Perry and McCreary County versus Kentucky. Those are establishment clause cases by Justice Breyer, because we think the Coach Kennedy cases obviated all of those. Um, and I skipped those. I skipped those cases too this semester. I mean, perhaps we might have a decision on New York Times for Sullivan, right? Maybe the court revisits the actual malice standard uh, for libel or defamation. Uh, we might I, have a good. 
I do think that there is a, a modest revisiting of that doctrine that I would hope the court does. And that is they reconsider the apl applicability of that doctrine to public figures as opposed to government officials. Um, uh, because I don't understand why public figures, you're allowed to defame a public figure unless you are knowingly saying falsehoods. Um, the theory of the original public figure doctrine is that people have somehow thrust themselves into the public. Well, now everybody is thrust into the public. Um, and I don't think that a different standard of libel or defamation should apply to, um, uh, to public figures. Just, be just because people are a movie star doesn't mean you should be able to lie about them. Uh, whereas there are good First Amendment political process reasons why you should be able to criticize the government and, and government officials should not be able to use tort law to silence people who criticize them. Mm -hmm. We might get a First Amendment case about social media platforms as well. That's a brewing issue uh, that I think that even you know, a lot of people in this call may not agree with. Uh, another area is non-delegation doctrine. I think the court is sort of flirting with non-delegation in the context of the major question doctrine, we actually get an actual straight up delegation issue where you can't resolve on this very narrow statutory grounds. Um, maybe also Article 3 standing. I think the court may take another look at it. There have been some interesting opinions that the courts are just making this up and they may decide to tighten this even more. All right. Uh, there's a question from John. Um, Faint-hearted originalists, right? Uh, Randall, how to do a faint-hearted originalist, and how do we give sort of, or how do we, how do conservative judges have the stomach or the sort of the backbone to do what they did in Dobbs? I mean, look what happened. We had an attempted assassination. We had a leak of the opinion. Every every force on the world is brought to bear in the court. I mean, how do we how do we deal with the the justices having the fortitude to actually write these sorts of opinions, knowing what they're going to have to suffer afterwards? Um. Well, I think Justice Alito recently in a talk he gave at the Heritage Foundation that I was present for, um, I thought captured his thought process pretty well. Um, you could only imagine it before he articulated it. And that is, he says, look, there's originalism for judges and there's originalism for scholars. Um, originalism, judges are constrained, not only, uh, are constrained by stare decisis, which is something that he has emphasized greatly in the past. Um, and I think that is a constraint, even on justices who are prepared to reverse cases like reverse Roe v. Wade and reverse Casey. They still are uh, pretty uh, committed to the idea that they're not going to reverse everything, that they they don't want to upset everything. They think Starry, Justice Alito said he thought stare decisis was part of the original meaning of the judicial power itself. I don't think that's correct, but that's clearly what he thinks. Uh, and in addition, he said that, look, um, and this is I think this is a very important insight that we need to keep in, uh, in mind uh, in order to issue an opinion by a if you write a majority opinion, you have to speak for at least five of the justices and they're not all going to agree on the basis of the opinion. And Justice Alito said that he feels an obligation to provide a rule of law for lower court judges. When he was on the Third Circuit, he said he was very frustrated when Supreme Courts had fractional uh, opinions and he didn't know what to do as an inferior court judge. And he feels obligated to write an, a majority opinion. And that's going to be an opinion that pleases five justices. And they're not all going to be five originalist uh, justices uh, concurring on original meaning. On the other hand, he distinguished that to originalism by scholars, which he said is not by, is not uh, constrained by stare decisis, is not constrained by the need to write a majority opinion. What he left unsaid, and, I, I, and I'll offer my views, what he left unsaid is, well, what is the relationship between originalism of the scholars and originalism of judges, or originalist judges supposed to do? And I think the relationship is this. I think the originalist justices are well aware of originalist scholarship that, set, that identifies what the original meaning of the Constitution is, and to some degree, what results that leads to. So they will be more comfortable that what they want to do, I think, is try to reach originalist results that would be justified by originalist scholarship by utilizing um, existing constitutional doctrine and precedent, if possible. Um, and th I, I don't know that I agree with that as the best approach, but I think I understand this as the approach. If I add that one further step 
to justice, what a Justice Alito commented on, the relationship between originalism for scholars and originalism for justices. I called this back in 2009, the gravitational force of originalism. The idea that lurking outside the frame, like a black hole in the sky, exerting a gravitational force on the stars that you see, outside the frame of a Supreme Court opinion based on stare decisis or precedent, uh, is the knowledge of the justices or they what they believe to be the case about the legitimacy or illegitimacy of the doctrine. Getting back to what I said originally, it's because they believe substantive due process is illegitimate on originalist grounds. They therefore believe they're justified in constraint coming up with a doctrine like Luxburg um, and now um, Dobbs that constrains the operation of that doctrine. That would be the, the best I can do to both explain what the justices are doing and to a very limited extent justify it. Very good. Uh, there's a question, is Chada in the book? Chada's not in the book. And, and I wonder if there might be some efforts to try to revive the legislative veto in the future. I, I, I don't see the uh, room, but, but Chada is, is an important separation of powers case. Sure. The interesting thing about Chada, which is the uh, the one house veto case, which the court held on very, very formalistic. And I believe formalism is a good thing, not a bad thing. On very formalistic grounds violated the presentment clause uh, because laws to be binding need to be presented to the president and to have a statute which allows one house to veto a regulation without passing a law is violates the presentment clause. It was a very int interesting intellectual, and I always favored the outcome in Chada because it was a formalist, re it seemed formalistly quite justified. But there's a kind of a new issue facing originalist scholars and theorists, and that is something that you might call compensating originalism. How do judges compensate for the fact that all kinds of other doctrines in the area are wrong? Um, and it's not entirely clear um, that the Chada approach, which is to give houses, one houses the ability to veto uh, it, the administrative state or what we might call the deep state when they engage in regulations that go beyond what the house thinks is, a, is authorized by the original statute. It's not clear that that might not be a compensating doctrine um, um, to the idea that uh, there should be no delegation to the administrative agencies in the first place, or the administrative agencies are not being uh, subject to the appropriate degree of uh, restrictions by the courts. Uh, at, at any rate, I just think Chada um, uh, may have reached the, the right, the wrong result for the right reason. Um, if you if you adopt this idea that there's such a thing as compensating originalism. All right. Uh, a question from Chris. Kavanaugh is no longer faint hearted, perhaps, question mark. Is it that he now feels comfortable applying his criteria for ruling sorry decisis for egregiously wrong cases laid on earlier cases? So, look, I think, you know, Kavanaugh have had a sort of a love hate relationship over the years, maybe, but I think he, 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 he wound up in the right place in Dobbs. Um, he put out this standard a few years ago. If a case is egregiously wrong, it should be overruled. It's clear to me he wrote this with abortion in mind. He laid out all the guideposts of when you're egregiously wrong, wrote ticks every one of those guideposts, and then some. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think Kavanaugh, at least with regard to the Roe case, was willing to go all the way. Uh, I'm still bothered by his concurrence. You know, he sort of reached out to decide this issue about the right to travel. Now, this is a very nebulous area of the law. He said it's very clear the states can't prohibit a woman from traveling out of state to procure an abortion, that question wasn't presented anywhere. No one raised it here, it wasn't, wasn't relevant. Why decide an issue that's not present? In my mind, that's the opposite of restraint. That, that, that's activism, really. It, it's studying a question that's not present in the worst sort. But you know, he had one hell of a term. Um, you can't minimize the fact that a person went to his house with a gun to kill him, right? I mean, I know the press doesn't want to talk about it. They want to ignore it. You know, It was item number 85 in the headlines that day. But we came this close from assassinated justice uh, if this guy didn't turn around and change his mind. Uh, so, you know, and the guy can't even go out in public. He goes to a Christmas party. People are attacking him for being at a Christmas party because other guests are there. So I, I think Kevin comes to get a bit of a bum rap. But, uh, you know, where it counted last year, Dobbs and Bruin, you know, he, he, he wound up in the right spot. So I think he, he had I think he had a strong term all around. I think we're entering into a very interesting uh, period of the Supreme Court, because for 50 years, both progressives and conservative justices have I, they have decided on the on the doctrines that they favor or the principles that they will follow with Roe v. Wade and abortion in mind. 
Um, and so we have a strong push for unenumerated rights on the part of progressive justices because the right to abortion is an unenumerated right. We have a strong argument against, we have strong skepticism of unenumerated rights, the Ninth Amendment, the Privilege Immunity Clause. Why? Because recognizing any unenumerated rights as legitimate might make a right to abortion because it's unenumerated a little more legitimate. Without abortion in front of us, without abortion in front of the court, it'll be very interesting to see if justices are now going to be freer to follow the original meaning where it leads them because they're not going to be as concerned with the implications it's going to have pro or con um, on um, on the abortion question. I don't know if that's going to be the case. I just I have taught as long as I've been teaching constitutional law. I've been teaching my students that behind a lot of these debates that are about other things entirely, including Justice Scalia's dissenting opinions in Lawrence v. Texas. Um, what lies behind those cases really is the the abortion case and what the implications of this argument is going to be for that. Once that has been decided, as far as the court is concerned, we may be entering into a new intellectual phase of the court. Yeah, I, th I think Dobbs required an exercise of courage. I have no other word in language used was an exercise of courage to liberate constitutional law from this single issue. Confirmation hearings no longer we had abortion. Right. I mean, maybe they will you bring Roe back. Uh, maybe, I suppose. But this truly frees the court from a shackle, a manacle that's been lingering over it. Look at Justice Blackman's concurrence in Casey. He said, point blank, the next confirmation hearing will be at abortion. Right. And, and he was right uh, with Souter, with with Thomas, uh, uh, you know, with Roberts, with Alito, with, with, with Gorsuch, with Brett Kavanaugh, with Amy Coney Barrett. Everything was about abortion. And now that issue is just oof, in the air, you know political process is working its way through. It's going to take some time, but we'll get an equilibrium. So I, I really think Dobbs is probably one of the most important Supreme Court cases ever. I, I don't want to be too much of an exaggeration, but it's, it's in my top 10. Uh, just the, the amount of change it had and how we, we teach con law. So Jeffrey Wood asked the question, so do you, does that mean you believe the, con, I, the CRA is unconstitutional? I assume he means the Civil Rights Act. Um, is on uh, so Rights Act of 1964? Eight, anyway, I, I don't know. Um, but it, to the extent, if I don't know what I said that would have led, so that means that the CRA is unconstitutional. I don't believe it was unconstitutional. The public accommodations part of the civil rights law was unconstitutional for reasons um, that are explained in this book, um, the original meaning of the 14th Amendment with Evan Burnick. So I won't go on at great length about that. Um, but there, but the Republicans who wrote the 14th Amendment also pushed and adopted the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which we discuss in our book, uh, Josh and my in, in Josh and my book. Um, and that was a public accommodations law. They thought that, a pub, that that discrimination with respect to the public accommodations violated the privilege or immunity of citizens to access public accommodations on a non-discriminatory basis. That, that was a fundamental right of citizenship. Uh, and that's something that we've lost sight of. Um, once the in the civil rights cases, Justice Bradley and for the majority uh, basically gutted um, that aspect of the 14th Amendment and invalidated, held unconstitutional the civil rights law, the public accommodations law that the Republicans who wrote the 14th Amendment ended up passing to enforce the 14th Amendment under their Section 5 powers. Another egregious decision by the Supreme Court using essentially living constitutionalism um, and of, or in, that, in this case of the Civil Rights Act, a tendentious reading of the text of the statute to reach results that they were trying to reach. I thought he meant the Congressional Review Act. That's what I thought he meant, not the Civil Rights Act. That's why that's what I was trying to get at. But I let Randy run with it because, well, yeah, it, it was good, well, <laughs> good anyway. So the Congressional Review Act, to, to clarify, is a mechanism whereby um, Congress can basically wipe out certain um uh, 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 regulations. And, and that's, I think, beyond the scope of our time. We're about to wound down. I'm, I'm okay with that. I don't have too many problems with it. All right. Um, closing thoughts. What does Selma think? Uh, is she still here? Or is she napping? Oh, I don't know. Uh, we, we, we caught Selma at a good moment. I, uh, wouldn't press, I wouldn't press, I could ask for Selma to come back. Yeah, bring, uh, her back. But bring her back. Bring her back. She, yeah. She's seen, uh, let me, let me see. I'll go get Selma. You continue, Josh. Right. So, uh, I'll just, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll just sort of give the closing pitch. Uh, the first edition of this book sold about 50,000 copies. It did very well. And the reason why was it wasn't just lawyers and law students who were reading this. It was about people. What motivates me at every juncture is to teach 
constitutional law to as many people as humanly possible. So I do TV, I do radio, I do, uh, I speak to my kids in school, just kidding, but I will eventually. Um, this will be a book that will live on for decades and will change over time as the court's canon shifts. But this is something that we encourage every level to read. Selma, what's your endorsement, sweetheart? Selma says it's thumbs up. Thumbs up. Okay. Thumbs up. Whoops. Get thumbs your up. thumb up, Selma. How, how, how old is she now? Four months old. Four months old. Four nice. months old. What, what was your birthday? Yeah. What was this kind of, so what is, what is her birthday? No, no, I'm trying to figure out the birthday. Okay, so tell, tell me later, it's fine, not important. <laughs> one day we will be over password questions and I'll get in trouble. Okay. Uh, you can tell Randy and I get along pretty well uh, most of the time. Uh, yeah, we annoy each other a lot, but we like each other a lot too. At the true, same time. True, true. And at least I'm not Evan. No, just kidding, just kidding. What? What was that? <laughs> uh, and I'm not Evan Burnick. His mom actually asked me, if I, oh, are you Evan? <laughs> Well, I have many good, good, excellent co-authors. Yes, so we, we got we, we had a good one. All right. And Selma's going to be a co-author. Aren't you, Selma? Yes. Okay. Kayla, are we done? Uh, yes. So on behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank our experts for the benefit of their valuable time and expertise today, including our sp surprise special guest panelist. He was probably going to win the award for the cutest panelist ever on a FedSoc webinar. Um, and I want to thank our audience for joining and participating. We welcome listener feedback at info at fed-soc.org. And as always, please keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about other upcoming virtual events. With that, awesome. thank you for joining us today. We're adjourned. <laughs>